everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us today on Veteran Voices. I'm the host today, Mary Kate Saliva, and we have a great guest teed up, so stay tuned. I'm just going to do a quick uh, programming note here. Of Veteran Voices is part of the Supply Chain Now family. We're in partnership with the Guam Human Rights Initiative, and you can check out what they're doing at guamhri.org and that great nonprofit, as well as in partnership with a nonprofit near and dear to our hearts, the Military Women's Collective, started by Marina Rabinek, Navy veteran. So you can check out what they're doing at militarywomenscollective.org and just seeing the great things that they're doing. Um, big shout out to Marina and her team. Um, and now, so without further ado, again, here on Veteran Voices, we interview veterans who are serving beyond the uniform and who are doing great things and continuing their service. Uh, so we have here with us today, uh, John Renkin. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Super excited. This has been a long time coming uh, to get you on here. I see you out there on LinkedIn just crushing it. And I know that's just, just a, the tip of the iceberg for all the things that you're really doing out there in the world. Uh, so, you know, I was hoping that you'd be able to kick us off our episode today with some motivation and get us all pumped up. Wondering if you could share a motivational quote with us today. Sure. Uh, people sleep peacefully in their beds at night only because rough men stand by ready to do violence. Oh, yes. George well, Orwell. Is is George Orwell and pretty, pretty damn motivational if you, if you ask me. <laughs> so, yeah. They don't I, sleep with I one just, eye open. It, yeah, it just, it, it so speaks to what what we're talking about and helping veterans. Um, these are our tribe. Absolutely. And um, and to go with that, that's one of the things I love about being a veteran as the, the community that we have, right? And just regardless of what we're going through and knowing that those there's good men and women that are abroad and at home that have signed up to, to protect us, keep us safe at night. So just thank you again for being on here and really Thanks. want to take our episode a bit back and talk about where you grew up. So if you could sure. share with us, wh wh where, where did you grow up? Everywhere. Um, started Everywhere. in Illinois, uh, lived there for uh, basically from first to sixth grade, then moved to Texas, um, spent four or five years in Texas, then moved back to Illinois, then joined the army and came to Kentucky um, served three years in Kentucky, then got out and went to college in Minnesota, then came back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I've been here oh, for, I think, 23 years now, something like that. Do you have, did you grow up in a military family when you say that you grew up everywhere? Well, no, uh, a lot of my family served in the military, but I didn't move that much because of the military. Uh, my dad was a factory worker. And in the early 80s, uh, with kind of like what was happening around the country, there was a lot of moving around. Right. Wow. So, yeah, that's well. And as far as your upbringing goes, did you grow up in like in a when it was everywhere? Do you have a big family siblings? No, I have two siblings, uh, a, a younger brother and a younger sister, um, just one cousin. Uh, I mean, I have a couple more, but only one cousin that I was close with. Uh, so pretty, pretty small family. Well, that's one thing that I, you know, I found with the veteran community. I didn't grow up with any brothers. So I feel like as soon as I joined the army, like I got like instant so many brothers. Right. And so I, I definitely want to, to hear a bit about um, some of kind of those, those uh, lessons learned, like what, what was it that led you to say, I want to join the military like do you remember that that moment or experience yeah so for me when i was younger i was quite the um quite the aggressive rambunctious young person and i actually joined the army in the early 90s because i wanted to kill somebody so not a great oh time goodness. in my life uh came out of a real abusive background and um that that ended up becoming my outlet which never ended mm -hmm. up happening but that was my motivation for joining and then my family is pretty patriotic. Everybody, um, my, all my uncles served, my cousins served, you know, so that was kind of my, well, uncles on both sides served. 
So it was kind of a normal path for my family. Was that something they were cool with you joining when you told them, or was it kind of like, no, stay oh, yeah. away, go the other direction? Yeah, no, my, my entire family was very pro-military. My grandfather oh, nice. actually cried when I told him I joined. <laughs> so, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And um, so, yeah, how, so how old were you then when you, when you went in? So I was 20, I was a little bit older. Um, okay. And the reason I was a little bit older is because I actually joined the Air Force when I was in high school on the delayed entry program. And then they found something in my blood work that's actually spelled like a terminal disease that would have killed me, but I don't have the terminal version. I have the other version. And so the Air Force like kicked me out before I ever came in. And then the army got a waiver and got me in. <laughs> so. You know, I keep, I jokingly say that I was like, Oh, you're missing an eye. You're missing a toe. Don't worry. The army will take you. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, well, the Air Force is like, story. you know, or they'll be like, oh, the, the army broke you. They'll keep you. We don't want yeah. you, says the Air Force. And I yeah. can't tell you how many times I've had guests on this show, too, where they're like, oh, yeah, I thought about the Air Force first, but the, the door was closed or they were on an extended lunch and uh, no one at the recruiting office. So. Right. Walk across the hall, and the army's like welcoming me with open arms. Here you go. Right. Here's some. So coke. I didn't love that. Now, <laughs> as far as the the job goes, did you have like a plethora of choices that you were choosing from? As far as like what you want to do, were you initially like, I want to be infantry? Yeah. So I actually did. Stuff? I scored uh, pretty high on my on my ASVAB. Uh, my mm -hmm. GT was like one twenty three or something like that. One twenty four. Nice. So they gave me an assortment of uh, positions to pick for, and all I wanted was Airborne Ranger. Um, course, they tried to talk me out of it, and they tried to tell me it wasn't available. Then I said Airborne School. Airborne School wasn't available. And no matter what I did, they just would not. Uh, and I didn't know any better at that time. I should have just walked out because uh, I would have gone to Ranger Regiment with my score. I was in great physical shape. I, I, mean, I came into the Army at a 300 PT score. Um, wow. so, um, they finally said, Hey, we can get you jumping out of helicopters and, uh, repelling out of helicopters. I was like, great, sign me up. Um, and so I, that's why I went to Fort Campbell. So definitely more of the excitement right off the bat, just like the recruitment mm -hmm. videos. So. Yep. Yep. Well, Adrenaline see, and, uh, adventure, my drugs. Oh gosh. Well, did you end up, um, well at that time at the, did you have a, did you get to go anywhere? You said you were at, started out at camp. Did you end up, never? never I never to got anywhere. to go anywhere. So um, I oh, missed goodness. Sinai by a couple of months. They they went in January. I got to the unit or they went in like April, May time frame. I got there in August. Uh, I missed Scotland. They went like the next year, but picked one of the other companies. Uh, I missed the Gulf War completely. Uh, and it wasn't until I got out of the army that I started traveling. I got out of the army in January and was, it was in, um, sorry about the laughter, um, no, it was in Guatemala within a couple of months, uh, as a civilian in the middle of their revolutionary war. Um, wow. then went you're to like, Japan finally some time. action as yeah, a civilian. Finally. <laughs> yeah, but then I didn't have a gun, so it wasn't the action I wanted. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know? oh no. So, well, um, as for the the best, but as far as like, I I mean, even if we don't go anywhere, because we have so many brothers and sisters at arms that end up not going anywhere, so to speak, or overseas. But we definitely have have mentors, right, and just great yeah. leaders that we end up emulating, or even the bad ones that we never forget that they're just ingrained in our heads. And we're like, don't be like that guy. Um, so yeah, as, sure. you know, this is a, I'd love to hear from you about um, some mentors or anybody that you want to give a shout out to and, and probably a highlight story of what made them so great. Yeah. So my squad leader was actually from Ranger Regiment, which is why I ended up getting into Ranger School in the first place. Mm -hmm. was a great leader, took me under his wing, um, really invested in me so that as a private in the Army, I, I actually graduated from Ranger School. Um, and it was funny because you brought up both bad and, and good. So my squad leader was the the kind of like highlight reel of what you wanted to be in the infantry. But my platoon sergeant hadn't done any of that. 
have had, didn't have anything. So I got to see both sides of that equation and my squad leader was amazing. Oh, I love that. And is it, is it as far as the, in the sense of they really took you under their wing when you were, or in, or in what way? Well, I mean, in every way. So he was taking me to church. He was training me. Oh, nice. He actually got me started in mixed martial arts. I mean, everything that my career has been, I can really point to him as the stardom. Isn't that incredible? I think that's yep. what we just like to show about that um, leadership, servant leadership, especially of just having your subordinates and how much they look up to you and how they care for the to some extent about what you say or what you what you think about them and what they're doing. So I love that he was there for you at that time. Yep. And how many years total did you end up serving in the army? So I did three years um, mm -hmm. in the army as active duty. And then as a civilian, I did 20 years with fifth special forces group as their combatives instructor. Now that's pretty cool. How does one end up, how did, Okay, now I got to know the pathway. What made you say, sure. I want to be a combatives instructor? So you like got the beating for the three years in the army and you're like, let me be a glut. I'm glutton for punishment. I'm going to continue on. Yeah. So I've been in martial arts since I was a kid. Um, started mm -hmm. when I was 15. Um, right before I joined the army, I made the national Taekwondo team. I was ranked third in the nation. And that would have been would have been a let me see here 90 91 something like that um 90 or 91 i was ranked third in the nation in taekwondo um and then he started training me in judo and then the first ufc came out in 1993 and i got to watch the first ufc and then i started professionally fighting when i got out of the army had 70 pro fights six world titles so when i moved back to uh, Fort Campbell, I was invited over to help those guys train. And I went over and started training with them. And um, they put me in with this just behemoth of a guy. And I ended up knocking him out. And then I knocked out another guy. They said, Hey, you want a job? And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll take a job. And that's, that's really <laughs> how it started. Oh, gosh, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Because you know, there's some folks that are thinking like, okay, what what is, um, you know, they might see it as like a very violent sport, um, very aggressive and not really in a positive light, but what, what has, have you seen with like martial arts, Taekwondo and whatnot, as far as how that helps people like in, in life, like yeah. some of the positives that come out of it? Well, the, the first and the most obvious positive is self-confidence and discipline. You know, I've, I'm 50 years old now and I've never been in a street fight since I started doing combatives and training and those kind of things. Uh, I mean, my last fight outside the cage was when I was a kid. I mean, 16 years old um, and I was jumped. So I didn't start that fight. Um, and uh, to the to the kind of nomenclature that it's violent. Well, football's violent. I mean, mm -hmm. hell, we've got jokes about hockey that I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. It's violent, right? So. And I disagree with the, the characterization of violence simply because violence is what we do to others that are unwilling participants. That's actually the definition is to violate. Uh, it's a sport and me and you get in a ring and we say, hey, we're gonna go to blows and the best man win or the, now we have women fighters. So the best woman wins and it's competition pure and simple. Uh, now from a military perspective, it's the single greatest way economically, physically, and mentally to prepare military members for the rigors of war, period. If that's violent, so be it. But we have to have that thing because we live in a violent world where people will abuse and take advantage of people that don't have the ability to defend themselves. To me, that's honorable. Do you do you have um sort of a success story that you've seen um, like you said about the confidence piece which I think is huge because you know, it's not something that gets issued to you when you join the military and we get a lot of folks that are wet behind the ears they don't even have facial hair yet you know they're still like yeah very very you know they're scared and then now you're giving them a weapon and they're still learning how to use it and just 
have, have you seen a success story of that with any of the the folks in yeah. special forces group or over, that you've worked over with that you, that you want to do you have yeah. one in particular that that you could share yeah so I, I won't use his name but i, I have a uh, a really good friend of mine who was a part of the initial invasion in both afghanistan and iraq in the 2000s and he actually double legged and then rear naked choked the number two bad guy in all of Iraq and captured him instead of killing him uh, through the training that he received wow. through combatants. He's a great guy, great story. Um, would he have been able to do that if that if that altercation had happened in 99 instead of 2003 or four? Probably not. Wow. No, and just like you said, like being able to do that in a way that doesn't actually kill the individual. Um, That's right. You know, it's just also just a, a very, very powerful skill. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing on that one. And then just, you know, I really want, you know, I was so excited to bring you on today to talk about your organization and and just some of the things that led up to that. Um, but I do want to touch on when you transitioned and ended up becoming an instructor I, I know for a fact, like based on like timeline, that there was probably nothing in existence. There was no DOD skill bridge program. There weren't internships. Nothing. There wasn't leadership sitting you down to say, did you do your disability claim? So nothing. what what was it, your transition like for you? Even Horrible. I can probably guess. Horrible. Yeah. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. So first of all, I didn't even know about disability. I fell 60 feet out of a helicopter in 1994 and they gave me nothing. Uh, oh my as a matter of fact, my squad leader pulled me off the objective and uh, said, get in your car and drive yourself to the hospital because we were in the middle of a training exercise. Um, so, I mean, uh, in hindsight, I wish that I had known the things that I know now because it could have made a lot of my life a lot easier. Um, so, but it wasn't. Uh, the other thing is because I did airborne school and I did ranger school and I did all these leadership schools. I thought, because everybody told me that when you get out of the army with everything you've done, that you'll you'll have jobs lining up for you. And I remember doing my resume and ranger school and airborne school and talking about all the cool things I did and getting to my first job interview and the interviewer looking at my resume and going, so what part did you serve in? And I, and I remember looking at him going, what part, what do you mean? Says, well, it says here you're a ranger. What what national park were you? No. Yeah, it's a true story. And I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, everybody in the army lied to me. Like, none of what I've done makes a difference to anybody. See, John, you could have been a ranger at a national park. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, be like, one of the know, most elite things that you can do go be a ranger, and they're thinking yeah. national park. And they thought Smoky national there. park. Yeah. Now this is, you know, 1996, right. uh, you know, so we didn't have a 20 year war at that time. I mean, even though our culture was positive towards military at this point, unlike right. some of our, our previous veterans from the Vietnam era, you know, they still were mostly uneducated about what the military does. Right. So, now, yeah. so, so with regards to that, like, you mm -hmm. know, now, like you say, you summed up your transition in one word as, as horrible. Now, when I went through my transitions during the pandemic, so I wouldn't quite say it was horrible in the sense of it was still limited access to resources at that time, sure. but at least we, we've gone uh, light years ahead, right, with what's available. And so just with this, um, would, would love to hear now about um, your advice to those that are going through transition because we still have so many thousands of, of service members transitioning every year from all different components, active guard reserves, and would love to hear your your thoughts for them. We may even have some listeners yeah. uh, tuned in that are transitioning now. So first thing is document, document, document. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that military service, even if it was in the chair force, you know, there are probably injuries that they cause to you. And you should document all of that and, and get really what's owed to you, not just for you, but for your family, because there's educational benefits that can be passed on to your kids to alleviate the burden financially of what it takes to put a kid through college. So document everything. And even though you're probably younger now, when you're 50, you're going to pay for what the military did to you. I promise you, there's mornings I wake up and my body hurts 
and it's because of, of what the military did, you know, and I don't, I, that's not said in a negative light. It's just the bottom line is, is when we're young men and women, we don't feel the same way. So document those things now, take advantage of it now. And I say, take advantage in a positive way, not a negative way. Um, so document, document, document. The, the other thing I would say is to have a clear path to where you want to be in the next five years. Um, transitioning is crazy. Uh, the world is changing at a very rapid pace. COVID accelerated some of that change in some areas and delayed it in others. Um, so have a clear pathway forward of what things are going to look like for you so that you can make educated decisions now on where you're going to go five years from now. No, absolutely. I think that's such an important uh, note to make because you said five years. Okay. There's so much we we kind of put ourselves on this timeline that we need to have it figured out. So we get our DD two fourteen in hand, and the next day, yep. come Monday, we gotta have figure it out. But as we know that, and, and so much research has been done on this, that we end up leaving our first job, or even our having a second right. job within the first couple of years. Uh, so to to know that you can, it's still okay, and it's normal that people are still transitioning even the the years following tr the actual transition that's right so appreciate that a lot and and now i know that you are helping folks who are in transition and um great segue to your organization now C could you tell us a bit about how how that all got started and how what you got yeah. involved with that yeah Really funny. So COVID ended my 20 year career at fifth group as the combatives instructor. And I started looking at the market and, you know, I'd been so specialized for so long. There were not really a ton of opportunities for me. I was either too qualified or not qualified in the realm of civilian stuff. And right. um, I was getting job offers for $12 an hour after running uh, arguably the largest combatives program in all of the army. And um, I just wouldn't accept that. And so um, started sales coaching because I've been in sales my whole life. And then in May of last year, Fort Campbell reached out to me and asked me to look into starting a skill program because a skill bridge program, because a lot of the veterans were getting offered $20, $30 an hour to be on top of roof, to be underneath the floor or to patrolling the highways as law enforcement. And I was like, well, let me look at it. They didn't have that when I was in. I don't even know anything about it. And I looked at it and I came back and I was like, hell no. I am not taking two years of red tape to start this program without pay. I was like, there's no way, right? Mm -hmm. um, I said, but well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll find somebody else who's already doing it. I'll bring them to Fort Campbell. I'll network them in with you and then let you guys do your thing. So I ended up finding Sales Platoon, uh, which was already existing. Uh, the founder, Raleigh Wilkins, uh, was in charge at that point, brought him to Fort Campbell, got him introduced mm -hmm. to everybody. And unfortunately, like what happens a lot of times in our tribe is he ended up taking his life um, and uh, kind of put the kibosh to Sales Platoon. And I reached nice. out and um, was communicating with uh, the silent partner of the company, Jim LaFell, and uh, just, hey, if you need anything, let me know. Um, just stayed in touch. And then he told me they were looking at uh, offloading sales platoon. And I said, well, if you're going to do that, I'd like to throw my name in the hat. And in uh, October last year, I got named the interim CEO. And then in January, as we moved through Pro of Eight, I got announced as the, the full-time CEO of the company. Um, and what we well, do is we take trans to that. Yeah, pretty, pretty crazy story, right? Um, so what we do is we take transitioning active duty members, we teach them how to do sales, and then we get them placed in companies that have BDR, SDR, account executive roles, or commission only roles, because some people are more geared for that and want that challenge. Um, some of the companies we're working with is like Verizon, T-Mobile, United Rentals, um, and some other great companies, Toshiba, we're right now trying to figure out a pathway into Toshiba. Uh, we've been meeting with their national recruiter, uh, you know, and so these these uh, young men and women will get out of the military and they'll have an opportunity to have a great base play plus commission and make between 37 to 50 to $60 an hour. Wow. I mean, and and to know that that resource is there for them, because 
you're you're there as a mentor as a guide and you have a team of folks that have sort of have been there done that so i think that that's really commendable and and huge to be able to teach them that skill set I mean, you said transition, is this like their last 180 days? So you have them yep. their last six months coming in? Yeah, we have between their last three to three to six months, whatever they end six up months. getting. That's great. And you have folks that are, are coming in from wanting to relocate anywhere in the world, just mainly yep. U.S.? That's amazing. Yep. Uh, I've got one gentleman right now coming from Germany. So, I mean, pretty much from everywhere. And how long's that the training take? Is is it really twelve weeks? Especially depending what route. Twelve yep. weeks 12 for weeks. everybody, no matter which route Everyone. they're going. Okay. Yep. Great. And then uh, if they intern, so if they get six months, which is more of the Navy and the Air Force that are doing that, then they intern with me, and I actually take them and show them how to sell in multiple venues that I'm selling in. So they now these, they these intern directly big. with me. Oh wow. Well, that's great to have that that one on one as well. Do they you have pretty big class sizes? Uh, we keep on about twenty to thirty people max. We do it three times a year. And what would you say sort of makes a a great salesperson? Like, are you able to tell kind of right off the bat which yeah. ones are going to be su really successful? Yep, they have to be self starters, motivated, disciplined, ability to work on their own with nobody micromanaging them, and they have to be hungry for more in life. They they really you know, this is one of my other favorite quotes. I was not meant, I was not born to grow up, pay bills and die. That is not who I was meant to be. And I don't think that's who many of our tribe were ever meant to be. But we have a system in place in our education and the way that we train people to where that's what ends up being a lot of people's lives. And so if you are a person who, who fights against that and you know that you were meant for way more than that, sales is probably for you. No, I think that, like you said, being that self-starter, being driven, being hungry for more. And it's so timely, right? With Especially with the pandemic, a lot of companies have moved online. They're not planning to go back into an office anymore. Mm -hmm. So like you're completely changing that or shifting that way of sales as well has, has evolved, right? And yep. we think like the old school door-to-door -door, uh, sales salesman with this, the products in the trunk of their car, but now, you know, we're way beyond that now. So, and I, do you, do you find as far as like industry goes, I know you mentioned some of the companies that you're working with, but is this all across all different industries? Across all jobs? industries, everything from construction to HR to recruiting, which goes to show that you can apply those skills anywhere, right? Which I think is That's really right. what our um, our service members are looking for um, right now. So it's great, especially because we tend to, to move around a lot. So is there something right now that it, as far as the way that we could help you or any of our listeners on the sure. call, you know, we'd be able to, to support yeah. you all? If you're in a sales role, would love to talk to your company if you're hiring salespeople. If you're not in a sales role and you know transitioning veterans connect us, uh, I'm super easy to find. I've got a pretty big uh, digital footprint. If you go to mysalesplatoon.com, that's our website where you can just find me on LinkedIn. I know, I, I really love that. And uh, as far as with the, you mentioned active duty. Now, are you are you planning to grow it out more for like spouses as well? And yeah, we, we, we're, we're fully... Any, if you're a veteran and you served or you were a dependent, you can come. Oh, dependents as well. Oh, great. Yep. So you spouses. Talk a little... Oh, I love that. Do you have any, um, as far as like, success stories now with the spouses, I just want to give them a special shout out too, sure. because we often, we tend to leave them out and we shouldn't because they're taking care of the home front and, and doing so many great things. So would love to yeah. hear about what you're doing with the spouses. Yeah, so I have uh, one spouse in our cohort right now, um, mm -hmm. and she wants the freedom to raise her children while still making a great income. She is a veteran and a, I don't know how that works, who's the dependent, but they're they're both active duty, but she's already gotten out. Um, yeah, so we have one right now, and um, I would love for her to be um, successful here in the next couple of months, which she's really super super sharp. So I think she will be. And then I can share that story when it happens. That's fantastic. And um and are they getting are they getting a specific certification or 
floral certification. Yeah, so everyone athletes. that comes through our course gets uh, Salesforce, HubSpot, and project management certified, as well as 140 other hours of certifications. That is a lot in 12 weeks. Yep. Goodness. Full time. <laughs> Full time. So um, I, I really, I really love that and appreciate that. Um, you know, and I, I just want to say, you know, to our listeners to know that you're, you're not alone in this, if, if you're even doing a career pivot, right? So John, it sounds like you did a scoop these people up as long as they have some of those things, the self-starter, right. that drive, they could have come from absolutely a non-sales background, uh, wanting to do a career pivot and they can just hop right in. Um, so John, could you uh, remind us again about how they could get a hold of you directly in your team? Yep. Just go to mysalesplatoon.com. You can fill out the form there or send me a message directly through the website. Oh, great. And that was Sales Platoon. So really appreciate, John, uh, your time today. Was there anything that you would like to say to our audience that I may have missed? Yeah. You're worth more than you think. Don't settle. Don't settle. You're worth more than you think. Don't settle. I love that. You can still be in transition. <laughs> So, yep. um, yes, absolutely. And John, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your story, uh, how you came in to the army of all branches. I'm a little biased. We're talking about the best branch here, but uh, yeah. yeah, go army. Um, but thank go you army. again so much. for. <laughs> I know we should have been decked out in our, our army gear today. Um, but thank you so much again for sharing more about Sales Platoon and, and as CEO, the direction that you're taking uh, the organization and being there for veterans, service members, and their families at such a critical time. Uh, I know that they're dealing with so much, so it's so important that they know that they're not alone and that we've got their back. Uh, so again, thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners. Uh, you can tune into Veteran Voices wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, and today's episode is in partnership with uh, the Guam Human Rights Initiative and the Military Women's Collective. And we are part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming. So again, without further ado, we hope to see you all next time here on Veteran Voices. I'm Mary-Kate Saliba, your host, and I'll see you all next time. Be good and be the change that's needed.